Dr. Amy Friedlander is currently on a three-year assignment as Senior Advisor in the Office of the Assistant Director for the Directorate for Social Behavior, Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences at the National Science Foundation. Okay, maybe you win the prize for the longest title. Um, prior to joining NSF, uh, Amy was Director of Programs at the Council on Library and Information Resources, where she was primarily engaged in projects about cyber infrastructure, preservation, digital scholarship, and encouraging partnerships and cross-fertilization of ideas across disciplines and agencies. Without further ado, thank you, Amy. Well, thank you all for um, joining us at this hour of the afternoon when we should all be repairing to the local bar. So um, your commitment to scholarship is commendable. Um, am I on? Can you hear me? Good. So before I go into my formal prepared remarks, let's do a little audience research here, because I am in the social behavioral and economic sciences. How many librarians do we have? Nearly everyone. Um, liberal arts, faculty, junior, good. When I talked to Arnold about this, like everyone else, I got my marching orders from Arnold. And he said, now there are going to be more than librarians in the crowd. So this is pitched to the faculty. Glad to see you're in the minority. So good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to join you at this session on building a culture for digital, science, uh, digital scholarship. I confess that I was a little taken aback when I read my assignment because it seemed to be about institutional change, which is a topic that I would hardly um, feel that I know anything at all about. So like any good academic or any good scholar, the first thing I did was to do a literature search. This is what we do. So as you can see, my first port of call, forgive me Harvard, was Google. And it picked up 20,000, 20 million, one, I had to write this down, 20 million, $100,000 results in 0 0.23 seconds. So those of us who are familiar with Google knows Google prides itself on performance. It's not merely enough to get you a ginormous some results set, but you have to do it fast. So 0 0.23 seconds. Um, th this struck me as, as large. So I also tried the Social Science Research Network, because that seemed to be topically appropriate. And um, I got 3,150 citations. When I limited the results set to higher education, it brought the number down to a tractable 41. So OK, this is now moving into the human scale, or at least the human scale for my brain. But finally, because the directorate where I work, Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences, funds a lot of research in this area, I decided to uh, take a look at what we funded by going into our award database. Now here I'm going to give you um, something, a, a statistic that you actually do need to pay attention to. When I say I, we fund a lot of research, we fund approximately 58% of the basic research in the social, behavioral, and economic sciences done in the United States, 58%. Okay, So we are the smallest of the directorates at the NSF, but we have a very large footprint on the structure of research in this area in the US, and to some degree through our partnerships uh, internationally. So that, that, that search yielded 1,153 awards in our directorate and in other directorates, notably computer and information science and education. Though that was still more than this bear of little brain could handle, so I reduced that one down now to active awards, which became a tractable 500, again, involving directorates across the foundation. So what does this mean? I think it means that this is a vibrant area of research and we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> Instead, I would like to share with you the results of an experiment in modified crowdsourcing called SBE 2020 that I've been working on for the last year and a half. And I will augment that discussion of what we did by some of the things I learned in, shall we say, my highly non-traditional career path. So let's talk a bit about the foundation and SBE 2020. I report to Myron Gutman, the assistant director of the NSF who heads the SBE directorate. The directorate, I'm going to assume that most of you are not familiar with the inside baseball of the foundation, so uh, 
The directorate is one of seven directorates at the foundation. They are mainly discipline-based. There's math, physical sciences, geosciences, biology, education, and so on. There are also seven uh, additional special, office, special offices within the office of the director. Um, one of them, Polar Programs, for example, supports our work in Antarctica. The foundation has a number of international collaborations and initiatives. And um, as I said, it, it, it reaches broadly into the basic research infrastructure of the country. Dr. Gutman conceived the idea behind 2020, and the idea was to consult broadly within the SBE research communities to ask them what they thought was important. And it was really that simple. And when he asked them what, what was important, it wasn't just, you know, they were going to all tell us their research is important, and we agree, we fund a lot of it. But what we wanted to hear was what is going to be important going forward? What are the decadal scale questions that the, the directorate should be positioning itself now to help them address? So there are two pieces to this. One is what does the science look like looking out 10 to 20 years, not the next funding cycle? And the second piece of that is what does that mean for the way the directorate conducts its business. So <clears throat> what happened? Well, the first thing that happened is we talked to um, the program officers. Now, in the first year, the central feature of this was this visioning exercise in which we went out and talked to the community through a, a, what, what we're calling controlled crowdsourcing. We used a mechanism called the Dear Colleague Letter to announce an open call for the submission of 2,000 word white papers. And, and that was it. All we said was, tell us what you think is important in 2,000 words. But it had to take one of three forms. We had talked to the program officers early in June. This was released in July, in August. And we built the website in July. But in June, the first step was to talk to the program officers and say to them, because they are on the forefront. They do the funding award, fund, make the funding decisions. They run the panels. They are the outreach to the disciplinary communities. And to say to them, to ask them that question, over the next 10 to 20 years, what do you think is going to be important? And three dimensions came out of that. And those dimensions were then part of the call. We said, here's the 2,000 know, 2, words to say to the, the foundation, what's important, and it should fall into at least one or all of the following categories. And the first of them is the obvious one. What is the content of science? What, is the, what are the driving questions? Those are sometimes called the grand challenge questions. We had just come off of um, watching what I think some envy our colleagues in the, among the astronomers who had completed their decadal survey. And the decadal survey is an, is a, a, an exercise in which the astronomers get together and they, after much discussion, agree, here's what we're going to work on for the next decade, and this is what we need. We need a telescope. We, we need the X. And so it, it, um, it offers the field a degree of coherence and discipline. Now, this is not to say that it drives the field from the top down. There's a lot of bottom up. And one of the things we were trying to do was not to impose on the field, but to truly listen to what the researchers thought was important, and then to map what they thought was important against what the directorate would be able to do. So the first question, obviously, is what's the science? What's important? And then the second question is the, is the next obvious question. Who's going to do it? What's the human capacity? What skills do they need? What, what are they getting in graduate school or through graduate training? Or what programs do we need to offer within the foundation that let them continue to learn? Because mid-career faculty are important to us as well. They lead the communities. They sit on tenure review boards. They are leaders in the field. What do they need? How do they need to be supported through the programs in the foundation? And then the third piece of it is what's the infrastructure look like? So Steve has just given you a very thorough discussion of what a digital library infrastructure or research infrastructure would look like. We asked the question of the research faculty now. Largely, this was devoted to the researchers. What do you think you need? What data services and, frankly, programmatic support do you need to do the kind of science that you think needs to be done, again, to 10 to 20 years out, not your next submission in the next funding cycle to the NSF? Now, this was not limited to the traditional, our traditional awardees. 
It was completely open. And I will say and start to show you, we got a very broad range of responses inside of our traditional communities and outside. So in response to the letter, we got 252 white papers. And um, that's me wearing my blonde wig. <laughs> Our first impression was, of course, of diversity, diversity in authors and in topics. We had only required and therefore collected minimal information on the corresponding author. So that one paper, for example, when I got deeply into these, had 60 co-signatories. We only needed the one person. So this was minimal metadata. And I did it because it is well known. Steve, I believe you'll confirm this. One of the barriers to participation by the research faculty is they don't like to fill out long forms of metadata. So we gave them four fields, one optional field, and most of them did all four. Four, OK? I believe after two, there's a tail off, isn't there? There are studies of it. So OK, this is not to pick on the faculty. The faculty are not in the business of creating metadata. Faculty are in the business of advancing knowledge. Let's be clear about this. This is what faculty are there to do. We, those of us in the support industries, which includes NSF, we are in the business of enabling them to do that well, to make it easy for them to do the right thing and hard for them to do the wrong thing. So we give them very small metadata forms. <laughs> and it was intentional. Now, it did mean that we got less information. That's the trade-off. For this, in this case, because we were moving quickly, because we were not doing analysis of the faculty, this was not that kind. This was an idea, a visioning exercise. I felt that was a reasonable trade-off. There are people who can, this, this is an argument. This is a discussion. There are reasons why it could have been done better. The other thing that you had to have was um, a legal meta, uh, email address. So the only authentication was a legal email address, and that Kate kept the spam out. There was almost no, there was no spam, I can say that, because we had to know who you were, and we had to know who you were from a legal email address. So there are lots of adventures. We can tell some funny stories about problems that people had. Um, I probably learned more about the NSF um, implementation of their networking software than I um, ever thought I needed to know. Um, I've also probably forgotten a lot of it. So what did we learn? This is the fun stuff. Well, the first lesson is the SBE scientists, and perhaps all scientists, are very generous. And I continue to be struck by the generosity of the response. We released the open call on August 10th. And we closed the call on October 15th. Now, let's think about the academic year. This is the height of, of busyness, if you will. They are getting ready for new term. By the time it, uh, it closed, you're moving into midterms. There are new students. There's all kinds of things that happen in mid to late August. And that was precisely the period in which we said, please set aside all those important things and tell us what you think is important on a decadal scale. P please do this. And 252 of them led enterprises or were the corresponding uh, authors on on papers in which they did precisely that. The papers are up there um, and will remain up there. So that is the first lesson, and it's the lesson that I keep coming back to, is the generosity of the research community. We had a Creative Commons license. We are well aware that we were. this is the federal government dealing in third party intellectual property. So there, there, this was not y'all come and it sits there. We did observe the rules, but it was minimal. So what else? What else did we learn? Well, nearly everyone has something to contribute. Our authors were extremely diverse. There was one self-styled grandfather who wrote a wonderful paper. All the papers are wonderful. Don't take that adjective seriously. Um, who wrote us a paper about sustainable forestry management and small business. We also had a college president who wrote about uh, digital government and civic engagement. And we had everything in between. We had at least one Nobel laureate, probably more. We had two physicians. We had um, a, number of, a group of nurses from a, a public health program who wrote about issues in, um, in the aging and the elderly and what that meant for the way you, you do a certain kind of analysis and a certain set of 
uh, disparities and, and issues that interested them. So when I say we reached well beyond our um, standard population, we were really impressed by the extent to which we got responses from the health community and the health, health services community, among others. So of the 214 authors, and that's the bar chart that you see there, who reported a departmental affiliation, okay, so we asked for university, department was um, optional, and that was the part about how we odd five, but only four were mandatory. 90, 97 of them, about 45%, named one of the traditional SBE academic departments, where by traditional departments, I mean economics, political science, sociology, and so on. The ones that you see displayed up there, not shown in this chart, are another 22 in departments of health sciences, communication, and education. The remainder, about another 45%, so it's 45, 45, and 10, rough cut, represent a fascinating diversity. We had computer science, we had classics, we had business schools, I think we had a law school, we had a couple of medical schools, we had in engineering, we had interdisciplinary centers, and we had more than a handful who wanted to self-identify as being affiliated with more than one agency on campus. And I think this speaks to the issues that um, our first speaker brought up about when you do this kind of work, it's not just that you can't find protection in a home, but you start to think of yourself, and Laura, perhaps you can comment on this, the, you think of yourself as being part of something in addition. So I'm in psychology, but I'm also in computer science. I'm in English or humanities, but I'm also in geography. So we, we found those kinds, I, I think that this, and it's hardly a representative sample, I, we, we should be wary of conclusions that we brought, draw here, but I think we're tapping into something that's coming from the ground up about the way the research community sees itself. Corresponding authors self-identify with 148 institutions, including universities, museums, libraries, not-for-profit organizations, a couple of corporations. Yes, we had some for-profits in there. The full range of colleges and the Carnegie of high, institutions of higher education, and according to the Carnegie classifications, was represented. Everything from the non the uh, four-year what is it post doctoral universities with very high research through baccalaureate and to special focus institutions like medical schools and centers. 41 of the 50 states in the US are represented in the set, as are five, for, uh, five countries in addition to the US, and 17 of the 29 jurisdictions in the EPSCoR program, which is a program within the NSF experimental program to stimulate competitive research. 17 of the 29 jurisdictions in that set are represented. This was very important to me. It was important to show that we, not only is interest broad, but that the call was heard and taken seriously broadly throughout the nation. This was not just the left coast, the right coast, and the Big Ten, but we had a very, to my mind, satisfactory response from it, from from all of the regions in the US and the full range of institutions of higher education. I think that is very important. We are a federal agency. We serve broadly. So from the <clears throat> so, so what do we do with this besides um, put on a wig and, and, and be nervous? Well, at first glance, the, the content of the paper is moving now from a description of what they looked like, things that we could count easily. Well, at first glance, they seemed equally heterogeneous. So how do we make sense of this? Well, we make sense of this by coding them. So I coded in three dimensions. And Dr. Gutman also coded. And not surprisingly, um, our coding was not identical. I think there was about an 80% overlap. So this gives us confidence that, that we truly were coding independently. So the first level of coding was field of study. And that was an effort to take a taxonomy that had been developed by our National Center for Science and Engineering Statistics, NCSES. They provided us a taxonomy, and we said, OK, if we have to be brutal and shove this into one bin, what would that bin look like? So that was the first level coding. The second level coding was what we would call free text keywords. And that was read the paper and 
assign some tagging to it. And I actually opened this to um, other members of the directorate, but here time got in the way, because I was going to experiment with how good our, our tagging was. No one had enough time, so the experiment didn't run. I guess we failed. But we did do this free text, so we had a very controlled vocabulary approach using a reasonable approximation for an authority. And then we had, what does it feel like? What does it look like? And then I coded a third way, which was to what extent did the papers reflect content? What is the science? Capacity, what are the human resources that were required, and what is the infrastructure? And these were not mutually exclusive. If a paper truly said all three, they got all three. But if they didn't, and it was mainly, a paper, particularly the data papers, we got 44 of them talked about data needs. And they were quite precise. They said, here's the realm of science we're interested in, and then they went off onto the data. The content of science ones tended to be, I think, and this is strictly back of the envelope, what I'm remembering from work I did last winter, uh, they tended to be more, um, here's the science and I need to do this. So what happened? What happened when I, we did this exercise? Well, when we looked at the fields of study, which is the let's cram this into a single bin approach, I was not really surprised that the larger single category, 17.4%, was social sciences general. So how did you get into that category? It had to be a paper that said in some, ex some explicit way, for example, I'm in economics, but I really think what's important is to look at the relationship between economics and psychology, right? This is behavioral economics, a very robust area of research. Or um, I'm in geospatial, but I think it's very important to look at the relationship between space and demography. So it had to be clearly something that was pushing at this notion of boundary, that it simply would not be adequately captured if we tried to stuff it into a more specialized bin. So I really wasn't surprised, given that my sense of how heterogeneous the papers were, that that turned out to be the, the, the more general category was the more satisfactory category. About 93% of the papers um, end up in fields where you might expect them to end up, either in social sciences general or in one of what we, again, were calling the traditional SBE science fields. And here they are, economics, communication, linguistics, the psychological sciences, political science, and I did some violence. I threw criminology into sociology, education, pedagogy, teacher education, geography, urban studies, anthropology, archaeology, and the health sciences. So that's roughly, I'd say, 97% of the set when you look at it from the most draconian, most disciplined approach. But then, of course, why be simple about this? I said, let's take a look at the keywords. And that was far more interesting. So we did a simple word cloud. And here, um, I can't even, I tried to do a bar chart. It was ludicrous. You, know, you couldn't display. Maybe if I had had the, the wall, I could have displayed it. Um, but the sets were so small, it didn't, they were all over the place, or not. So we saw complexity, neuroscience, brain, crisis, disaster, civic engagement, change, urbanization, large-scale questions, very focused questions. And it occurred to me and to Dr. Gutman that we were doing violence to this by attempting to, do, uh, to, to force this into something that was starting to look like a synthesis, that in fact diversity is part of the finding. It's a rich and diverse field, set of fields, and people work at multiple scales. However, it isn't a rag bag, because when I put in our three dimensions, content capacity and uh, infrastructure, in fact, some things started to pop out. One is the importance of interdisciplinary research or multidisciplinary research or cross-disciplinary research. I know there are distinctions, but with, for purposes of this exercise, we bundled them all together. And the second thing that comes out is the importance of infrastructure, and in particular, data and services to support computational um, analysis of data. That is what they would talk about. So yes, the science is important, and it's subtle, and it's fine-grained, and every one of the two, 252 papers deserves your reading. I'm going to give you the URL, and I'm sure you're going to rush back tonight and read them, because it will be on the test in the morning. <laughs> Um, and I'll be on a plane. Um, but it stands out, these two themes or super findings stand out above it. 
And this, we became more convinced of this when we ourselves now read the papers. I've, I've read them several times. We started to read it ourselves that this, co this underlying coherence in what might otherwise be thought to be a rag bag of ideas, in fact, exists. These are, they're, the scientists are talking to each other, even if you're working in cognitive neuroscience over here and behavioral economics over there and civic engagement and decision making and all the different kinds of things that we look at in the SBE directorate. So if we were going to boil this down to what do they believe? Well, we, it is clear that SBE scientists believe that future research will be, note the decadal scale, data intensive, collaborative, and multidisciplinary. Many papers speak directly to issues in collaborative or multidisciplinary research. Many also speak to data and to topics related to data, data collection, analysis, to data management, conversion, archiving, and preservation. If you know how to look for it, you can actually see the full data life cycle that threads itself through the papers. Many of the papers um, that do not appear to address interdisciplinary research, in fact, do. And I, my favorite example here comes from the eco economics community. We got a very robust reaction, uh, response from the economists. They, they really stepped up, and there were on the order of 40 to 50 papers. But in fact, when you read the papers, what they're calling for is interdisciplinary research. <clears throat> for example, the papers on labor economics are talking about the effect of household structure and life experience as, small as children. And I was there at the American Economic Association in January last, uh, in January, last January, in which a very famous economist stood up and said, we have to start working better with psychologists and sociologists, because they are studying family formation and the effect of decision making, of dis certain kinds of experiences on children. And when you look at sort of labor force participation over the long haul, you start with what these people, what we learn as children. And the people who do that, and they say, people who do that are psychologists, sociologists, educators, health sciences researchers. And he was, he was making the case. So here we have, if you will, um, the economists, the well-disciplined economists, calling on the other disciplines to help them study the problems they care about. Similar observations can be made in a number of the other scientists, sciences, the psychological sciences, and so on. And in fact, there are four particularly fertile crosscuts that we identify, and I'll come to that a little bit later. We became more convinced of our central finding when we went on the road. So having done this white paper crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing exercise and having started to formulate some ideas about what we thought it was telling us, we went on the road. We visited the University of California at Berkeley. We also went to the University of Texas, San Antonio. And there were presentations at a number of the professional meetings to start to lay out the preliminary findings and then to collect feedback. What resonated? Where did people say, stand up and say, no, 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 you got that wrong? And where did people stand up and say, you really need to do this? This is what's important. And, and that was, um, it was really quite wonderful, again, how passionate people were about the science and the science that we helped them do. So we went out and we said to them, um, what should we do? What, and besides, you know, in some cases, telling us what they told us in their papers, there was some tension, not a great tension, but some, shall we say, disagreement about whether the research should be purely curiosity driven or whether it should be problem oriented. And it is true that many people do come to the social sciences by way of life course, life experiences that affects the kind of problem that interests them. So there's a tension there, whether we should you know, do problem oriented research or should we simply say, within this framework, um, go forth and be smart? Uh, we also asked the question at the end of each session, what should NSF do, right? This is, for many people, many applicants, this is the moment you've all been waiting for. You have the head of the directorate, and you can tell him what, what he should do. And I'm there next taking notes. So what should he do? Well, embrace change, break the guild remains my favorite response to that question from a young faculty member at Berkeley. But even more powerfully than embrace change, break the guild, um, 
what they talked to us about, and this was in the mid-career mid and senior faculty, as well as young faculty and graduate students, was they needed help finding partners. Exactly the issue that we heard about, that Laura talked about. In the, what does a center do? She, she asked the question. How does a center do, become a creative environment and not a silo? Well, one of its functions, I think, drawing on my experience now at CLEAR, as well as having listened to you, an important function there is it helps, it's a, it's a place where people can go in order to find either like-minded people or complementary expertise. And I, we were on major campuses, well-resourced campuses. And how do we do this? You have to help us do this. We're, we're just the government. We're not, we're not here to do that. And again, how does the faculty, how does the research community view what they need from us? They view as needing help finding collaborators, finding people that they can work with to do a certain kind of research that they don't feel that they can do alone or in their labs. Another thing that surprised us in this was the vibrancy of the discussion about ongoing education and training. Again, when we coded the uh, papers, there was relatively little interest in the papers about capacity development. There'd be an end, you know, a sentence or two at the end, and we have to worry about training the next generation. But, you know, when I, I sort of did the frequency distributions, it didn't leap out. When we talked to people, that's when they said to us, we need help, we need to learn how to be able to do this. Now, within the current framework, NSF has programs that, that can, can do this and, and can be tweaked or adjusted or um, used as, as they currently are. Um, we have a number of programs that support grad, undergraduate students, graduates, graduate students, early career faculty. The National Institutes of Health has a number of mentoring programs that can be used to help people start their careers and at the start of their careers to learn something new, to branch out in a new direction. So there are a number of models that we can embrace and we have opportunities to do so within the foundation. So that really leads me to the next, the next issue, which is what do we do next? I mean, this is nice. We did, we did um, a study. People were enthusiastic about it. Um, and we've written a report. I, I even have a copy here. We have a report. But in fact, and I, when, we, when I look back at the 2020 process, it's really a continuum of products. There are the websites themselves. The, well, first there was the engagement with the program officers. There was the Dear Colleague letter. There are the websites. There are the white papers, which we will continue to make available. There is a PDF, which takes the abstracts and identifies the full author team. And so you can just get a quick look at it if you really don't want to cuddle up with all 252 papers in a single reading. We have the report. And of course, now we move into implementation. So let's take these in groups. As a service to the research community, we will make the papers available for the foreseeable future. Nothing is forever. We will do our best to keep them there. Um, certainly, there is currently no plan to take them down. And we think that they deserve to be read in their own right. The report is not a synthesis of what's in there. It, for one thing, um, and this is frequently a response that we get from the social science community, is this is not a representative sample. So to attempt to draw broad conclusions about, say, behavioral economics or the psychological sciences based on this uh, would be flawed. Nevertheless, there are very thoughtful papers in there on both of those topics, and I would encourage you to explore them and the other rich material that's there. Um, we know that there have been some steps beyond what we did, with that we've seeded some excitement in the community. For example, the economists have banded together. All of their papers are individually available through the Social Science Research Network. And there is a compendium of them with an introduction by two leading figures in the economics community. So you can see those through SSRN, either individually or clustered together. We also know that at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, which hosted a remote teleconference with other institutions in the CIC, that on the basis of the experience that they and their faculty had with this, they mounted the year uh, of data stewardship, which began last month. So that provoked that. Um, and we're, so NSF, 
we are in the business of, of um, catalyzing research, and we are pleased to see these activities move away from us and out into the community. The report itself lays out a vision of how the directorate can take the central insight about multidisciplinary, collaborative, data-intensive research and move that or into the directorate's programs. So let's take a step back, for those of you who don't know the directorate well, and take a look at how the directorate is structured and how the findings in the 2020 report could inform what we do. So the, this is the directorate. As I said, it, has, um, it is headed by an assistant director, and it has two research divisions, the social and economic sciences and behavioral and cognitive sciences. And then we have NCSES, which I mentioned briefly. This is a, statist a federal statistical agency. It um, collects data and performs statistical analysis um, on behalf of, of science policy. It's broadly used, it, it, um, and it, answer it is within the directorate, but it also has a line of reporting, I believe, to the National Science Board. So that is a statistical unit. There are smaller inter, uh, integrative programs off of the office of the director, of the assistant director, and in general, this structure has served SBE science well. Uh, we pride ourselves, the directorate prides itself on the number of Nobel Prizes in economics uh, that uh, have come from work that we have sponsored. In addition, we had done, supported fundamental work in applications of geographic information systems. Uh, notably, Mike Goodchild's work in Santa Barbara. We mount major surveys in data collection that are broadly used and uh, central to the conduct of SBE science and policy that is based upon the conduct of that research. We have statistical data that I mentioned that supports science policy decisions. And most importantly, I think, is we provide broad support to students and faculty whom, between them, cultivate the flow of knowledge and advanced knowledge and enables a robust research a re robust research community. But there are tensions. The, the directorate, like much of higher education, reflects roughly a mid-19th century outlook organization of science. The, the foundation was organized in 1951, and it more or less reflects the structure of the sciences, say from rough, roughly 1950 to 1975, and, and with some changes. And certainly it's not moribund. The, the programs continue to evolve, but if you look at the disciplinary structure, it is very much of that time. More fundamentally, it reflects a view of the social sciences that really dates to the early 20th century and issues that had to do with industrialization, poverty, inequality, how do markets work, instability. All of those continue to be fundamental questions, but the way we think about them probably has changed. And certainly, even if it hasn't changed, we should be asking the question a century on, has it changed? It's OK to say it hasn't, but we should ask the question. So that is one source of tension. A second source of tension is multidisciplinary work. As we heard today, multidisciplinary work cuts across disciplinary lines, and new cross-cutting initiatives necessarily create a tension with the standing programs. Infrastructure intended to support data collection, management, and access provides, presents the same tension. Such resources have to be broadly relevant, otherwise you wouldn't be supporting multi, multiple communities. But you don't know in advance exactly what those contours of participation are likely to be. So inevitably, when you build infrastructure, you have a tension between what is specific to supporting this kind of research and what is the broad level of support that you need to make available. And that is very much what we heard in the background of Steve Chapman's talk. He's nodding. What do you make available across all of my faculty, and how do I make, meet the needs of this faculty member over there? Sometimes you have to say, we go this far and no further. And finally, collaborative work, you knew it was coming, challenges the model of individual achievement, individual achievement that is central to current systems of prestige, evaluation, promotion, and tenure. It does. That, and of course, that is how you progress in your career. 
and hence the impatience that we heard from young faculty who are being told, mentored, to move up through a certain course in order to go from assistant professor to associate professor to full professor and so on up. It, th there's a, a way to do that. And the way that you do that is predicated on, in many cases, on individual achievement. We know how to measure individual achievement. Whether we do it well, we have metrics that do that. We don't know how to measure collaborative achievement. It's much harder. So how might the 2020 exercise be used to inform change, frankly, in an environment of, shall we say, constrained resources, at least for the near future? So we view the next few years as an opportunity. Why is it an opportunity? It's an opportunity to step back for a moment and think about, as we have thought in this last year about the decadal scale, to think about where the directorate should be going. How can we do this without the pressure of um, having to, to, to have a broad and growing funding program? So we hope for the best. I don't know any more about the federal budget than anyone in this room. But I don't think anyone is going to read a newspaper and think that Santa Claus is coming early this year. Now I said there were four, let's start with the content of science and the four topics that we think are particularly rich. It's not the only ones that we see in the papers, but these are four that we think um, capture many of the papers and start to demonstrate relationships among the, the research communities and lend themselves well to this collaborative, multidisciplinary, data-intensive science that the scientists themselves are telling us they want to do. The first one is demographic change. We all know this one. It was in the UNESCO report. The shift, uh, the depopulation of rural areas, the shift to the coastal areas, fragile coastal zones where we should not be building major cities, but we have inherited them. So there's a, a range of questions having to do with population change, family structure, it has geospatial implications. It's really a very rich topic. Second one has to do with disparities. So and this can be disparities in a sense as driven by the market, but it can also be access to resources. So in the library community, we heard it today, well, there's coming to be a digital divide. So access to resources um, can create resulting from disparities or disparities that become obvious because of differential access to resources. And that has, that's a notion that has broad applicability across a number of fields. A third, um, and this one is very exciting for me personally, is linguistics, language, and communication, including brain behavior and cognition. So the communication is one of, um, is a cross cut that lets you look at the cellular level and at the societal level, right? So how do you acquire language? How, why does sign work, right, ASL? Why does American Sign Language work? The, the great question, why can you understand me? And it's not just because I'm talking, I'm using my hands, I'm standing in front of the room, I'm fiddling with PowerPoint, I'm remembering to check my script. There's lots of reasons we speak the same language. Um, why does that happen? What are all the elements that go to answering the question, why can you understand me? How is political and civic engagement affected by rhetoric? That is also a communication issue. And finally, there's new technology and social networks. Now, technology is a little different um, because, as again, we heard in the first paper, technology informs the way we do what we do, but it is also an object of study. So these, why did we choose these? Well, they meet three fundamental criteria. The first is there was evidence of research in the, of interest in the research community, very ground up. Uh, the NSF prides itself, and I think rightly so, on the extent to which it is uh, based on consensus. We listen very closely to what the researchers tell us in multiple ways. So that's the first, is there had to be evidence of community interest. The second is there had to be some sense that a, pro a project coming in could not be easily funded within the existing structure. And here, communication was a good example. When we talked to the executive committee of the National Communication Association, a number of people said to us in the room, we want to apply to the NSF for funding. We want to apply to your director. We don't know which program. 
And we said, well, what about linguistics? Well, when we talk to linguistics, it doesn't seem, to, what about them? You know, I'm really interested in that. So it, you could start to see, that was one of the moments when we realized that what at that point I was thinking of as language and linguistics was communication, and communication was really a much longer thread than I had realized at the time. So how would we then rethink the way we organized the foundation, the directorate, or maybe just tweaked a few programs to make it more welcoming to these kinds of topics. And finally, sustained investment would be likely to engender cross-fertilization of ideas. We are in the business of transforming the frontier. We want to push the boundaries of knowledge. So there are, when we look for, when we, at, there are two merit, merit review criteria at the foundation. One is broader impact, and the second is intellectual merit. Intellectual merit means, what have I learned that's new? Maybe I'm not learning something new, but am I learning it differently? And does that open up a new cycle of research? So new means, when I talk about cross-fertilization of ideas, it is an answer to this question not just interesting, but is it, is it likely to unlock another cycle of research? So we're looking two generations of research down the road. So what does this look like on the ground? What does it mean if you work or you, ex you would like to apply for funding? Well, this is a, a bit of eye candy, as we say in the business, and I'm not going to expect you to absorb it. I um, mean, all the details. But what you see, I think, in it is that we're taking an incremental approach, and we're keeping the broad parameters of content of science, building capacity, and supporting infrastructure, or at least initiating infrastructure support, and that we're looking in terms of what does the community want to accomplish? That's the community goals. What could we expect to do in the next decade? And in the next one to three years, and this is where the researchers um, always start taking notes, what should you expect to see come from the foundation? Well, again, this is all in the talking phase. I mean, this, doc, this is in the report. You can read it in detail. But you'll see that the first thing we're calling for is to continue the consultation with the, with the research communities. The high level kind of discussion that we had is nice and it gets us started, but what does that mean for the psychological sciences, for example? What does it mean for statistics and measurement? And I call out those two examples mainly because both of those programs have begun, a process, uh, have had workshops and have begun to talk to their communities about what an agenda for research would look like. Where do we want to place the investments? What kind of research do we want to support? In the area of, of training, uh, in capacity building, we already have programs in place that can be modified in order to support um, on continuing training in multidisciplinary research. Now, um, this again is in the discussion phase, but it, but it is consistent both with the values of this exercise and the validation of those values. It worked. People were able to talk to the future of research within this framework, and it is incremental. We can work within the existing structure and begin gradually to move towards a different way of doing science. In the area of data and infrastructure, which is a popular topic today, um, we already support a number of these, uh, these major surveys. And so the issue here is to expand the services that are offered and eventually to offer training in high performance computing and to explore new ways of doing the analysis and of communicating findings. So although we've heard much about the uh, potential for, um, for presenting findings, I think we need to move up beyond the notion that it will be a journal article on steroids or a journal article in some electronic form. I think the exciting thing is to talk about simula simulations, visualizations, games. Um, economists do a lot of work with games and game theory. So why not present your, your game engine and you look at the various alternatives analysis in the context of the paper? I mean, why not support that as a form of publication? Because that is, after all, the finding. Well, today, of course, there is the, the way we present our findings is the juried article. And I don't think that the notion of a vetted juried object is going to go away. Let me just say that right up front. Um, 
whether it looks like the kind of journal that I edit, I think, is an open discussion and um, one that I thankfully don't have to talk about today. But from the perspective of science, what is important about the vetted, peer-reviewed journal article, regardless of what that looks like, is that that becomes the record of science. We have spent 500 years evolving ways to capture the record of science because we need the record of science. So I would argue that we will continue to have a vetted, peer, some sort of peer, whether it's peer review or some other form of vetting, but we will have a vetted record of science, which for the foreseeable future is going to look like the journal article. So the question becomes, how do you link, how do you deal with a changing landscape? Now I've already talked about the relationship between um, the challenges of moving from single investigator small team science to collaboration and have said point blank that I think we're going to have a vetted record of science. But I also think we're moving towards an integrated landscape of data, the intellectual output, and commentary on that output. So that the eventual landscape will be the object. There will be something that says, some, I thought about this, and here are the, or we thought about this, and here's the finding. Here's the data that supports the finding, and by the way, here's the commentary around that. And I think we're moving towards that landscape, painfully and with a lot of challenges. Now, the notion of um, integrating data with the, with the publication is not new. Right? It began in the biological sciences, the protein database in the 1970s. It um, took off when Nucleic Acids Review said in order to publish in this premier journal, you need to deposit your data, and that was then followed by Science and Nature. So yes, there are tensions between, with the publishers, but the publishers um, are elements of the infrastructure, at least for the foreseeable future, and probably they too will change. So um, there, there has been a close and cooperative relationship with the, the journal publishers. And there are, um, the challenge for us, I think, both on the sponsoring side and in the libraries and certainly for the research community, is a reliable way to link individuals known as authors or teams of authors with the correct output known as the article. And so we heard about this in the infrastructure in Steve's presentation. This brings us to the notion of persistent identifiers. So on the one hand, leaving aside whether we can solve the problem of who really wrote the paper, I think we can chip away at least at, the, at, at mechanisms that help us bring order to this. So um, in the case of who's the author, CERN, um, the high, high energy physics lab outside of installation, actually outside of Geneva, has very complex rules for who's an author and the sequence of authorship. Now, I wouldn't say that we all have to follow the, the lead of the physicists all the time, but that's an example. You can have rules about who's the author and who gets credit. That's a way to do it. Um, MLA is starting to formulate such rules. The second element of this are the identifiers. So ORCID is one example. It was um, the result of a collaboration between the libraries, I believe, led by MIT and the publishers, Nature Science and all the rest were involved in this. And this is a way to have an identifier follow a person or a person follow his or her identifier across his or her career. And it stays with you. NIH has an identifier that that they use, they are, you can federate these, but the point here is it, it does two important things. One is it allows you to track someone's career. So when you go forward, this person really did this and, and this is how we find it in um, an online world. The second thing it accomplishes is it disambiguates the uh, challenge of is this Tom Smith the same as that Thomas Smith over there. So. Um, that's some of the solutions that are in place. Um, the specific implementation is less important than the fact that you have to have an identifier in this system. And there, there are experiments ongoing with this. The complete system is going to be hard to build. It's going to come 
into place in bits and pieces. Some of it will be very carefully thought through and put out there. Others of them, like the HT, like um, uh, domain names, are going to have been little fixes that came in and suddenly migrate. Oh, don't wrinkle your nose. Domain names for those of you who sort of don't know the story started out as a fix to something that was called the hosts file in the very early internet days. And it's become something much more sophisticated, and now it's a critical piece of the, of the underlying of the network infrastructure. The complete system is going to take a lot of, will be long in coming. There are a lot of pieces that um, need to fall into place. But I think we're groping towards a large scale system that we can start to discern. It will be widely distributed. There will be a lot of stakeholders. Um, it will accommodate heterogeneous platforms, services, data, technologies. It'll accommodate heterogeneity in all the ways we can think of and then more than we can't even think of. Um, it will have elements that are carefully planned and it will have other elements that are sort of ad hoc and we ask the question, um, how did this happen? But here we are. Um, any of us in this room can think of a set of, da of, of a data problem that we want to deal with, fMRI, protein sequences, imaging. Um, we're clearly in, a, in the midst of a multi-year experiment as bits and pieces of the eventual system come into place. But in the end, I believe that that world of integrated data, products, and commentary will support good science. Getting there will be painful. And in the meantime, we're going to confront a bunch of vexing questions. For example, um, what do you do if you are the third author of a piece and it is retracted, not because of malfeasance, could be because of malfeasance, but you found out there was an error? What if the machine hadn't been calibrated correctly? And so there is a retraction. What, now that we're tracking everybody, right, what does that mean? You, know, you were the third or the fourth or the 15th author on the paper. Does everyone who um, contributed, or even the lead person in the design of a data set, does that person get cited every time? Or do you put them in, that person in a footnote? And how is appropriate credit accorded to someone who has been key to building a, data, a database that goes on to be fun, become fundamental to the way we did it? Here, here's the news, or non-news. Um, the, the, the solutions to these questions are human solutions. The technology um, enters into this partly because it abets the creation of the problem and partly because it gives us ways to solve the problem. But the solutions will be with us and what we decide is important and how we're going to structure this world. Now the SBE 2020 report isn't going to tell you an answer to those hard questions. What it is going to tell you is that we learn two big things. One is that the future research in the social, behavioral, and economic sciences will be multidisciplinary, collaborative, and data intensive. And the second thing that we learned is that the structure of the SBE research is changing. And that change is driven from the bottom by the nature of the science that the scientists want to do and by demands from faculty and students to do that science. So where does this end up? Well, this is Quincy Shelter, and Quincy Shelter is in Antarctica. And scientists who go to our research facility in Antarctica spend two days learning survival uh, tr skills in extreme environments. It's the trip of a lifetime, and it's really, really dangerous. So I wish I could tell you that this integrated landscape would come into place quickly, that the tectonic sh plates will shift over the weekend, it'll be in place by Monday, and we can go forward. Um, I wish I could tell you that it would be in place for the young faculty in your lifetimes. I doubt that. I'm sorry. But I have lived through my own career ups and downs. And like Antarctica, I can tell you it's exciting. Yeah, it's a little scary sometimes. But opportunities come up where you least, least expect them. And I think that you will find that analytical skills, literacy, and an open mind will serve you well, whether if you're young faculty, you want to stay in higher education, or if you want to go out and found the next group on. I, I think that you will find that those attributes of 
intellectual curiosity and open mind analytical skills and the ability to bring people together, those will serve you well. And that is what we all learned when we came up through graduate school. So I'd like to close by telling you a story about the late Alan Newell. Alan Newell was a pioneer in artificial intelligence and one of the architects of the computer science department at Carnegie Mellon. And Alan said that um, he wanted to learn at least one new thing every day, that that would be a good day if you learned at least one new thing. So for everyone who has stayed until 5 o'clock today, I hope that when you think about your day as you're getting ready to go to sleep or to brush your teeth or to do whatever it is we do at the end of the day, I hope you can look back and you can say, today was a good day. <laughs> thank you for inviting me to your campus. Thank you for listening to me. And thank you. I have had a very good day. <laughs>